Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 154th New Social Environment. I'm Nick Bennett and I have the pleasure, the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a celebration of art in general with our guests, Dean Doderko, Eleanor Hartney, Chris Larson, Paul Pfeiffer, Jacob Proctor, Aliza Schwartz, Robin Tews, and founders Teresa Lischka and Martin Weinstein with our co-hosts, Charlotte Kent and art in general executive director, Irene May Zhisham. We're also thrilled to have the poet Kate Meissner here, who will read to close today's program. The Brooklyn Rail acknowledges that we are on the unceded territory of the Lenni Lenape, Canarsie, Shinnecock, and Munsee peoples. I'm also emphasizing that unceded means that the land was not surrendered legally or willingly. We acknowledge the many indigenous nations with ties to this land, and we recognize that the Lenape still call Manhattan home. Finally, the Brooklyn Rail stands in solidarity with the uprising continuing to unfold across the country following the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Nina Pop, David McAtee, James Scurlock, Jamel Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Rayshard Brooks, Rhea Milton, Dominique Remy Fells, Toyn Salau, and in response to generations of structural violence against Black communities. Black Lives Matter, and we will continue to support ongoing action in the struggle for racial justice. Before I introduce our co-host today, we would like to begin with a brief moment of silence. Thank you. And now to introduce today's co-host. Charlotte Kent, PhD, is Assistant Professor of Visual Culture in the Department of Art and Design at Montclair State University. She received her PhD in Comparative Literature from the Graduate Center with a, with a certificate in Critical Theory. In 2019 to 2020, she was the guest editor for the Creative Research Center, producing a series of posts on the topic of collaboration. And with so many guests today and in the spirit of keeping introductions short, I will now pass the mic over to Charlotte. Thank you, Nick. Um, thank you everyone for joining us for this indeed celebration of art in general. For 40 years, this organization has helped artists produce and present new work. This has been done with great spirit and resolve, embracing local and far-flung communities, committing to challenging topics and practices. Even if you never worked at Art in General, you were likely influenced by their vision and dedication. We are honored to have so many speakers today who have been integral to the legacy of Art in General. Please note, some have other obligations and will need to slip away, but wanted to be here to participate as they can for this celebration. Given the stories to come, please put any questions in the chat as you think of them, and we'll have time at the end for a few. Also, because this is a celebration, we will have a toast. So make sure you fill your glass before the end of the Q&A so that we can all raise our glasses or mugs or whatever you will to this great organization and its vision of what the arts can be. Leading the charge today is the extraordinary executive director, Irene Shum. Prior to joining Art in General, Shum served as the Associate Curator of Contemporary Art at the Mental Collection in Houston, Texas, and was the inaugural curator for the Philip Johnson Glass House, a site on the National Trust for Historic Preservation. In her work, she has regularly explored the intersection of architecture and art, and her projects have been published widely. Earlier in her career, she worked in New York at the Museum, New Museum of Contemporary Art, with New Museum of American Art, and the Museum of Modern Art, where she co-organized MoMA's first survey of landscape architecture. Her work at Art in General brings her full circle. So Irene, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Charlotte, for the introduction. And thank you, Fong, Nick, and the Brooklyn Rail team for organizing today's program at such short notice. Um, hello, my name is Irene Shum. I am the executive director of Art in General. As many in the audience may know by now, due to the financial pressures of the COVID-19 pandemic, Art in General will permanently close upon reaching the milestone of its 40th anniversary at the end of this year. This was a difficult decision that the board of directors and I made together only after pursuing all avenues 
but with the great conviction that art in general has made a lasting impression and that art in general will be an inspiration for the future and for the, for the arts to come. Before we start today's program, I would like to make a few acknowledgements. First and foremost, I would like to thank each board member individually for their service and dedication to this great organization. They are Roya Kadavi Haderi, Mary Lepides, the secretary, Leslie Ruff, the president, and Maria Spinelli. I would also like to thank curatorial associate A.D. Cantor, who worked beside me throughout the pandemic and who has been truly indispensable. Lastly, it has been important to both the board and to me that we close with grace and gratitude. The board and I want to express our deepest appreciation to everyone, and by this we mean everyone who contributed to the organization in the last 39 years. From the alumni artists, to the guest curators and our partner organizations, uh, to all the former staff members, from former directors, curatorial associates, administrative assistants, to seasonal interns. And in addition to our donors and the countless visitors who walked through our galleries and attended our programs, I thank you and the board thanks you. Um, so a little bit about me and my journey to art in general. Um, I started my career at the New Museum of Contemporary Art in their multicultural internship program after graduating college. This was a one-year paid internship funded in part by the NEA, and this was when Marsha Tucker was still the director and the museum was still located at 583 Broadway between Houston and Prince Streets. At the time, in the mid-90s, many of the artist-run alternative spaces were within a half a mile walking distance. It was a small community and that's when I became acquainted with art in general. For me, art in general distinguished itself for its openness and inclusion. Art in general actively presented new work by artists of color and women and engaged with the neighboring immigrant community of Chinatown. It was a space where I saw myself represented. So when I was appointed executive director, it really felt that my career had come full circle. For me, I was drawn to Art in General's amazing history as one of New York's original remaining alternative art spaces and to promote the legacy of Holly Block, who truly set in place the mission and values of the organization during her 18 year tenure. Although my tenure has been short, it has been a privilege to lead the organization through this critical period. During this time, it has been important to me that art in general remain present and engaged with, with the here and now and continue to be forward thinking, even though we're closing. For posterity and to honor our history, we have donated the entirety of the organization's archives to the Smithsonian Archives of American Art for future study by students and, and scholars. To complement the papers at the Smithsonian, we have also donated a complete set of our publications to the downtown collection um, at NYU's Special Collections Fails Library. Lastly, the remaining inventory of our books and printed materials were gifted to Art Resources Transfer, a nonprofit that promotes arts literacy and distributes art books nationwide free of charge to rural and inner city uh, schools and libraries as well as to prisons and alternative art, um, sorry, alternative education centers. Um, to remain present, we organized our last new commission, Project 270, Signs of Change, and the online exhibition, Dropped By and Found You. Project 270, Signs of Change, is an ambitious nation, national get out the vote poster project featuring artists from all 50 states, Washington DC, Puerto Rico, and 10 metropolitan areas. It was important that this last new commission be both an affirmation and a declaration of the organization's values, which are to be politically active, culturally relevant, socially engaged, and supportive of new artistic talent. The roster of artists proudly reflects the diverse populace of America. 
organized by A.D. Cantor, dropped by and found you, thoughtfully presents images and new research drawn from our digital archive of the past 15 years. Turning now to today's program. I am so happy that the Brooklyn Rail has been able to gather together today's panelists. All are here to celebrate the history of art in general and to share special memories of their experiences and how art in general impacted their lives and careers. Our panelists include the alpha and omega of our history, uh, our founders, Martin Weinstein and Teresa Leska, as well as the last artist to have a physical exhibition, Aliza Schwartz. In addition, we have several artists and curators from each directorship. From Holly Block's tenure, we have Paul Pfeiffer, Robin Tews, Chris Larson, and Eleanor Hart, um, Hartney. Bridging Holly Block's tenure into Ann Barlow's, we have Dean Dierica. And from Laurel's, Laurel Patek's tenure, we have uh, Elisa Schwartz. We also have with us uh, Jacob Proctor from the Smithsonian, who will speak of the importance of our organizational archives and the legacy of art in general. Each will speak in chronological order. So um, let's jump in, shall we? Art in General was founded in 1981 by Martin Weinstein and Teresa Liska. The name Art in General was a play on words. It was an acknowledgement of the broad range of artistic mediums and art forms that may, that may comprise varying uh, creative practices. It was also a nod to the General Hardware Manufacturing Company, a family owned business that housed and underwrote the organization for 35 years. Martin and Teresa oversaw Art in General for the first seven years. Martin, Teresa, would you share with us when and how you decided to open Art in General? Um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> to say that we decided to open it, I, I wouldn't, you know, it, it was just a show, which turned into two shows, which turned into, you know, five shows a year. It was sort of an organic, kind of a thing. Um, we started, you know, it was a sort of collective. Um, yeah, a, a lot of that, that was happening all over New York in, in that period. Um, we did not do, you know, one person shows of people in the collective. It was a sort of looser organization than that. There were writers and musicians in the group. Um, and uh, yeah. It was the whole point was that it was started by artists, uh, run by artists, for other artists. Um, artists decided to take the ball and run with it during that time. Um, it was all about showing our work to other artists and uh, making that transition from the micro world of your studio into a larger, wider community and uh, an exchange of ideas. Uh, we all shared the work of running a gallery. We all um, sat the space. We all mailed out cards for the shows. We ran the elevator uh, and we made uh, midnight runs with a bucket of wheat paste to put uh, posters up on the available empty building walls and uh, boarded up windows because back in the late 70s, early 80s, it was pretty quiet uh, in Soho. and. Um, we hung this, the shows too. And uh, then when Holly joined us, it was a perfect uh, marriage because Holly was totally artist focused. She was artist centric, as we say. Uh, her whole point was uh, not just the work, she was always hungry to see new work, but she loved interacting with the artists themselves. She was an artist, artist trained. She got to know their lives. She had an amazing memory for remembering the names of children and all kinds of details. And uh, so her idea was to have a space where you could just drop by anytime, check stuff out. Uh, people would bring their slides and she was immediately responsive. Uh, we would convene a panel and uh, look at the work and you could submit your slides and show within a year. It was it's a quite an amazing turnover back then. And I guess, you know, one of the things that, you know, in the seven years before Holly came that 
I would say is that, you know, we made an organization that Holly Glock would want to run. Um, no, she definitely just blew it out of the water. She built it into an amazingly vibrant organization. But I guess one thing, you know, uh, the image that's on the screen, um, this was the kind of thing that you were able to do in those days. Eva Kuruluk was a, in Poland, a well-known um, feminist critic and artist. Her work is absolutely beautiful. And she was in New York with, you know, when martial law was declared with a show that had been shown in Boston. And um, a, a friend of ours who was at the NYU uh, Center for Humanities, I think it was yeah. called, and Eva was in it too, you know, brought us her work and within a month and a half, we had it up on the wall. You know, mm -hmm. things were, <laughs> we were able to do things quickly. Yeah. yeah. And, um, before Holly came, we were all already getting money from the New York State Council on the Arts and some other foundations. But um, yeah, it was it was a, it was an, an amazing fit. I mean, the day Holly came in to interview for that job was probably one of the best days of our lives. <laughs> yeah, we also had started a, an international. We had two uh, international shows. One in. Scotland and one in Eastern Europe. And uh, that was right up Holly's alley as well. I mean, she expanded it to include Cuba, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we just wanted to keep everything open and accessible and responsive. Uh, you keep things the least institutional that we could, um, the least corporate. And uh, it worked. Uh, uh, just as an anecdote, I'll share the we, we had slide panels and we one of the things that was important even before Holly came was that we wanted the panel to be different every year. So that, you know, one year an artist would send in and be rejected and we'd send a letter out saying, try again, try again, try again, because the next year it would be everybody's favorite artist because it was a new panel. Mm -hmm. And um, there was one year that we're looking at slides and we would accept group proposals from, from groups of artists. And we received a, you know, a proposal of artists not from New York, uh, a group of women. And I hear Holly in the corner, she was looking at the resumes and she just said, oh my God, because we were all completely thrilled with the work. And she just said, oh my God. And, and we said, well, what is it? And she said, they're all like 25. <laughs> yeah. And yes, I think within a year we were showing that work. We made it a, a habit not to read the resumes as we looked at the work because we didn't want to be influenced by what kind of experience they'd had or how old they were or anything. And uh, so after we'd chosen the work, we'd look at their resumes and we hear little comments in the background. 1974, <laughs> meaning birth year, and, <laughs> and stuff like that. So uh, we tried to be as blind as possible when putting shows together. Well, that sounds a good one. <laughs> <laughs> we tried to be as uh, uninfluenced <laughs> as possible. <laughs> Would you like to say anything about your new space, um, the Bronx Museum's um, uh, Manhattan Outpost, the Block Gallery, and the Artist in the Marketplace program that, uh, that, that it hosts? Yes, uh, Holly came to us from the AIM program. We hired her, she was running the AIM program when we hired her. And um, it, over the years, AIM was definitely a feeder for art in general. Many of the artists we showed, probably some of the artists in this panel today, came to us through AIM. And um, yeah, we, we went on to uh, put together this, it's it, the Block Gallery in her honor, uh, Block Gallery in Residency. And um, if you check out the link to the website, you can see the artists who are currently, uh, until the end of Jan, it's gonna start up again the end of January, hopefully. Touching wood. 
And it also continues uh, that running theme of um, a group family style uh, mm -hmm. that can get together in the space, aside from their own little studio spaces in the block gallery, to just uh, keep in touch, keep up to date, have meals together, chew the fat, that kind of thing. Um, well, Holly worked with us to develop the space. And when we asked her what she thought was necessary in downtown in a space in the art world, she said, studios, it's gotta be a residency. And so it is. Thank you so much, Martin and Teresa. Um, uh, just to say the image on the screen is the first exhibition ever at art in general. Right. You can see clip on lights, the whole <laughs> the early, early 80s yeah, uh, right. aesthetic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The, um, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, the original location of Art in General was a half a block from Chinatown. Um, Art in General embraced the neighboring immigrant community and was truly ahead of the curve in promoting racial diversity, hosting weekly meetings of Godzilla Asian American Arts Network and exhibiting Asian and Asian American artists. Um, this leads me to our next guest, Paul, artist Paul Pfeiffer, whose early career was intertwined with art in general. In total, um, Paul participated in five exhibitions from 1991 to 2004, including Dismantling Invisibility, Asian and Pacific Islander artists respond to the AIDS crisis and Injustice Made in America. Paul, um, would you share with us your most poignant experiences and memories of art in general? And, um, and I know because you're pressed on time, maybe to talk a little bit about Deniston Hall, an artist space that you founded with friends in upstate New York um, and how that continues your activism. Yes, thanks. Um, yeah, the show that you mentioned, um, Dismantling Inv Invisibility was in fact the first group show um, uh, that I did in New York. Um, and, but maybe let me just back up and say, you know, I, I, I definitely um, am toasting art in general today and, and with everybody else here celebrating uh, its legacy. It's bittersweet because, you know, it is a crisis time that we're losing this, you know, essential torch-bearing um, like entity in our cultural landscape. And I, I remember back in the 90s when I was involved with art in general, many conversations in which, you know, we, we talked about the role of nonprofit spaces like art in general as, as kind of feeders in the ecosystem of the art world. And, and I think about it today, you know, especially with the, the focus on kind of uh, global warming and, and the very real kind of like, um, like uh, way that we are experiencing uh, the, the, the shocks to our environment. This idea of like art in general's place in the ecosystem really, I mean, it speaks to aspects you know that are maybe more invisible within the the for better or worse sort of like marketplace oriented uh, environment of the art world you know they we see the kind of the blue chip um stuff very like kind of front and center but there's so much that's invisible that describes the bigger kind of imaginative context the mid the bigger imaginative conversation that the blue chip couldn't exist without. Um, and, and I know that, you know, with Art in General starting in 1981, it really represents, you know, one of the first in, in that, you know, that development, um, I mean, before which there only was the blue chip um, and, and a recognition starting in the early 80s that, that you, and, and, and before in the 70s, that there just simply had to be like conduits to bring you know, new energy, new blood, like new ideas into the system for it to even just survive. So 
Yeah, the takeaway for me of my own experience, you know, first exhibition in, in, uh, in, in New York was Dismantling Invisibility. And it was a show in which, you know, I think about 10 artists uh, uh, were invited to think creatively about what was going down at that time in terms of the AIDS crisis and the culture wars and, and to respond, uh, specifically thinking about the, the ways that uh, the conversation and, and the lack of conversation about health uh, concerns were playing out in uh, immigrant communities where there were special layers of like, um, you know, like real, real, real questions about um, how people would be um, at risk um, if, if, you know, necessary details of like kind of patterns of behavior or of, of um, like sexuality um, were brought into the light. Um, so uh, issues of language and, you know, like the, 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 the fact that, that, that it, you know, a lot of kind of what was being discovered about AIDS was like slow to be translated, uh, you know, beyond the English language. So in a sense, I guess the takeaway for me of art in general in terms of this exhibition was just simply like, you know, that, that there, there's a natural relationship between art and politics that is not either or, or even like oppositional one to the other, but rather, you know, like facets of, the imaginative and creative uh, world and, um, and of the nature of innovation, that politics and art are two facets of the, the actual like complexity of innovation and creativity. Um, another, yeah, another project that I worked on was uh, a collaboration with Project Reach. Um, over two summers, well, over several summers, uh, art in general, had a partnership with a community center in Chinatown called Project Reach um, that was sort of like a, an empowerment um, after school program for uh, teenagers and, and young adults. Um, all I can say about that, it was, it was rocky. Um, for, for two summers I participated and uh, worked alongside other artists like Nicola Wai, um, Sarita Kurana, uh, Kara Lynch, and many others, um, and you know the question of like how um, like a, a, a social services organization like Project Eats could interface with uh, with artists who were tended to like think in very like uh, self empowered out of the box ways uh, to create kind of a, a shared dialogue that was meant to serve uh, the the empowerment needs or the disempowerment situation of like young people in Lower Manhattan um, and the boroughs. Was, was not an easy thing to grapple with. There was a lot of arguments, but the fact that art in general hosted that kind of liberatory pedagogical process and discussion to me, like, um, well, it relates to Deniston Hill that you, you, you're mentioning. Um, I mean, all I can say about Deniston Hill is that it's, you know, I'm working with a group of artists in, now um, as, as one of the code uh, directors, um, along with Julie Meritu and Lawrence Chua, um, that to, to, in a way, we're returning to the same questions. You know, at, at this moment of crisis, you know, should, it doesn't seem right to, to conduct business as usual. Um, we're interested in, in, in new models that don't yet exist and, and looking for ways to facilitate uh, the production of group knowledge towards that end. Um, in some ways, this is antithetical to the kind of individualism that's cultivated in the art world, uh, where, where artists are purposefully given full agency to see like what one mind can do uh, when fully actualized. I feel like there's a real need to like think about, well, what like Fred Moten calls consent to not be a single being, um, to like, with intention to enter into like the possibility of new spaces that are not about individual agency anymore, but that accept that there's a way in which knowledge can and is produced through intersubjective and collective processes and, and really the need for it. The last thing I'm gonna say, and I'm gonna pass on the mic is just, you know, 
there, there's just, you know, there's a lot about freedom of expression, freedom, diversity, uh, representation of the underrepresented that is tied up in like my own experience of art in general. And in some ways, you know, like, yeah, the fact that it's, that we're losing it today is not arbitrary. Um, you know, in some ways I kind of feel like uh, questions of kind of fundamental democratic process and, and categories in society are going through a wormhole in the era of social media. Um, I mean, in some sense, there's a question for me and that I just want to leave with that, you know, in some ways, I, I wonder if the, the kind of the, the power of social media replaces some of what the intentionality that, that galleries like Art in General uh, were born out of in 1981, uh, in the sense that we're now in an age where through social media, all voices uh, are on stage uh, in a way that simply wasn't possible before. Um, and yet that does not lead to positive results. You could say that in some ways, what we're seeing is the rise of a kind of like perversion of democratic values that we took to be kind of, uh, you know, un unsaleable. And, and so the rise of populist leaders and the, the, the use of algorithms to create these kind of like uh, bubbles that people now live in um, and only see the things that they want to see. Um, these really change the stakes of the conversation around freedom, democracy, and, and diversity. In a sense that it's not enough to like just continue to like promote those values that we've inherited because in some ways they're um, being co-opted and using to other ends. Um, so we can't assume that, that uh, I don't know, you know, the, 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 the highest values in a, in, a, uh, in a democratic capitalist system necessarily lead to positive events. Thank you, Paul. Um, that's uh, a lot to consider. Um, the artist as activist brings me, like artists and activism brings me to our next guest, uh, painter Robin Tews, who's long been rumored to be one of the original Guerrilla Girls. Like Paul, Robin showed at Art in General several, several times, uh, first in 1992, then in 95 and 2000. Um, Robin, would you talk about your relationship between your art and your social, social activism? and anything else that you might want to bring up today. Oh, sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you for this invitation. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be part of the celebration of, for Art in General and Holly Block. I met Holly in the late uh, 1980s, around there, and she was a powerhouse. She really, with her progressive thinking and her imagination and her passion about Art in General project, really put it on the map. It was a place where not only the public could come, but critics and, and writers and the artists too. And we always expected to see some really cutting edge, innovative ideas, exhibitions that were really uh, inspiring. Um, and I showed in a couple, quite a few shows there. Yeah, 1992, I think she curated a salon show. And in 2000, Joan was a show called Private Worlds that Joan Semmel curated. And then in 1996, I was, in, I was asked to do a window installation, which is the image here, of, uh, it's called titled Boys Room. Um, it, at the time I was a single mom and I had a, a five-year-old son. So it, it's a, based on that experience, but it's really also based on the expected gender roles that the culture uh, re reinforces on us and sort of asking that question. Um, I do remember Holly was so terrific. She was so nurturing during that whole process. She kept asking, what, what kind of sandwich do you want? We're getting sandwiches. And she was getting cups of coffee and she was so, made it really uh, comfortable for everybody. Um, there were a lot of other shows at that time going on that were connected to uh, politics and ideas that were happening at the time. There was a, a show uh, called, at, uh, called Violence Against Women. It was at the Thread Waxing Space. 
and that was right, I think the same time, maybe a year earlier. And a year it was, earlier, yes. It was early, a year earlier. Yeah, I think you mentioned that at some point. And it was a project that Hope Sandro and I created. We called it The Other Side of the Rainbow. And um, it was showed in other places too. It showed in the Whitney Museum and it was called The Subject of Rape. And they had a show called The Subject of Rape. This was a, uh, a dialogue that had been, was happening at the time. And uh, now with Me Too movement, I'm really thinking I need to revive this project again that I did with Hope. So it was called The Other Side of the Rainbow and we had color coded index cards and we asked people to participate by mail or in, and when the exhibition was going on, they were at a table with these, it actually looked quite beautiful, these color coded plexiglass uh, index cards and they would write their testimonies and we had asked, we, we um, asked them to write different uh, subjects, but the one that really stuck in everybody was, we just received so much uh, feedback from was the um, subject of uh, sexual abuse. And most of the people who wrote in it were women. And some of them were in tears telling us that this is the first time they even expressed uh, what happened to them. So uh, it, it was, it was a really, really great project that and everybody would sit there and, and participate in it. It was this time where it was really nice to have this kind of collaboration with the public and they could, people could just sit there and write it or they could actually just read them. Um, and, and then Holly did this, uh, um, it was, it was a really cathartic release. I remember that being so important that, that we felt very good about having done this project. It was an incredible release for a lot of people who needed to do that. And, uh, Holly also had another program. It was the art in general artist tour where she invited, I don't know how many times a year it was, maybe twice or and she invited a handful of artists to come to share their studio space with critics, curators, and people who wanted to just see the work in the studios. It was just a terrific idea. And oh my gosh, I remember that it was the day before and it was daylight savings. And it's not like, there's no, no iPhones, there's barely any, that, that platform was barely existing. And I wake up, it was daylight savings time. I, I woke up late and I forgot to turn up, put on the alarm or set the clock back. You had to manually set it back. And I was, oh my God, I'm like, I can't go. I was so upset. I went, I ran to meet them. It was at a restaurant and all the people who had graciously paid to be in this program. And I was half dressed. I don't even know what I look like when I got that. But I, when I got there, I was so impressed by Holly's holding court and making everybody feel so comfortable. And it turned out that I was not the only artist who forgot <laughs> the, about the daylight saving times. There's a lot of us who did. So it became, she made a, she had a great sense of humor about it. And she was just so lovely. She was always so um, warm and I, her smile. I just always remember her smile. So, but on another note and for the record, and because it's something that I know Holly would want to share with everybody is that Holly was a guerrilla girl. If you don't know who the guerrilla girls were, it was an anonymous group of women artists formed in 1985 to combat sexism and racism in the art world. And they did this by postering the streets in the middle of the night with posters. This again was before a computer and before the internet, 1985. And, uh, the girls agreed, they all took the name of a deceased women artist to not only protect their identity, but also to um, keep that woman's art name alive. And the girls agreed that when one of the girls passed away, that her identity would be exposed. So that's why I have the honor of sharing that with everyone. Holly's gorilla girl name was Anna Mendieta. And I'm sure she would be honored, I know she would be honored, to be remembered as Gorilla Girl Anna Menediata, along with other, her, her, all of her amazing accomplishments that she achieved in her lifetime. Thank you so much, Robin. That's such an amazing story. Your work's so prescient as well. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just love the Gorilla Girl story. Um, thank you. Thanks again. Thank you. I am 
Now introducing our next two guests together, artist Chris Larson and art critic and author Eleanor Hartney, because they collaborated on an artist in residency project in 2000, uh, Saturday night, Sunday morning. Um, Chris, Eleanor, how did you meet and decide to work together? And um, did this collaboration influence your later work? Um, maybe I'll start just to lay the groundwork how I got from St. Paul, Minnesota to New York City. Um, I would like to thank the Brooklyn Rail for hosting this um, conversation to recognize and celebrate um, art in general. And also special thanks to Martin and Teresa. I do remember meeting you, it was 20 years ago. And I found you as um, really lovely, kind, supportive artists and people, so thank you. Um, in, so after graduate school, I moved back to my hometown of St. Paul, Minnesota, and was doing work there in the Twin Cities. And you know, the goal was to get to New York and an opportunity came up where the Jerome Foundation, which is based in the Twin Cities and supports artists in New York. Um, I was nominated for artist residency program at Art in General. And so this really marks my first, my very first exhibition in um, New York City. So I always look at that one as a very important moment um, within my career. Um, it was 20 years ago exactly this month. I was in New York for eight weeks and the opening was on November 8th and that was my wife's birthday. And so I remember that very well. Um, the installation was, uh, I, I primarily used um, rough cut wood and it was a challenge to get to find rough cut wood in New York. And so somehow somebody got a hold of somebody upstate and they shipped in a bunch of wood and we brought it up the elevator. And um, during the residency, I constructed um, the sort of, as you can see at this, there was a fake floor and this large mechanical machine that a body would be hooked up to. And um, the work explored themes of relationship between body and machine and architecture and labor and home. And those themes are still really at the center core of my work. Um, today in 2020. Um, the installation disappeared after the exhibition was over, but there's a barn. I made a three-story barn, kind of barns skyscraper, and I'm not sure where that went. I think it's still somewhere in New York. Maybe Martin can fill in where that barn went. Oh, Martin has it. And, um... Yeah, for my part, this was part of um, Art in General's, they had this artist in residence program and um, they brought people from elsewhere. And I was involved actually with several of these art in residence projects where artists um, you know, from outside of New York, sometimes from outside of the country came and were given this space and given all the resources that they needed to create a work. And then as a critic, I was you know, kind of working with them and also um, writing a, uh, you know, a kind of explanatory piece afterwards, um, which I guess it was a brochure, I think that was distributed. Um, and I don't remember exactly how Chris and I, we were put together. And I, I suspect it was by way of the Jerome Foundation because I had a background in uh, Minnesota. I had lived in, in Minneapolis for, I think from 1980 to 1983, just prior to coming to New York City. And so, um, you know, as someone with a kind of Minnesota background, I think that they, they, I think, actually put us together because, of course, I didn't know Chris at the time um, because he was much younger. Um, but anyway, it was, it, was a, it was a wonderful piece. And, uh, of course, part of, you know, the and this is what sort of the magic of art in general in many ways, um, you know, it was kind of whatever the artist wants, they will try to do. And so, yeah, this, as you can see, is a very complicated piece with sort of a very kind of complicated materials. And, and yet, you know, it was all made possible. Um, and it's clear also, I, I think if you, um, you know, I, I think, Chris, that this was your, this was your first piece in New York City, or it was very early on in your career, right? This is my first exhibition in New York, yeah. Yes, and of course, you know, Chris has gone on to have 
quite a, a, a good career. And interestingly, you know, kind of going against the grain, not staying in New York, but, but doing it by way of Minnesota. And I think that that was one of the things that Art in General was, was you know, by giving exposure to people in New York who had these bases in other places, um, you know, it, it helped them very much to kind of widen, um, you know, their, um, their network, their associations, uh, just to get their work known to a much larger audience. And I don't know, Chris, would you say, well, how, what was the effect of this uh, residency on your career? I mean, absolutely life-changing on many different levels. Um, you know, the, thinking back on the residency, it was a pretty unique situation where they did bring someone in from the outside of New York into the heart of New York. And with that residency, they, they put me up in a, a loft on the Lower East Side, which was really incredible. And they also gave you artist stipend. And Holly, I mean, all the things that everybody's saying about Holly, absolutely true and so supportive and just an extraordinary person. But there was a day where Holly brought me to her desk and said, okay, part of this residency, what we do is we connect you with, let me know who in New York you want to have come in to see your work, to have a conversation with. And they, she said, any curator, any collector, any dealer, any writer. And so I kind of made a list, but she made, she had her own list with her huge Rolodex. And so those, those galleries, the galleries came in some were a little more um, gentle than others. There was one where before the ele elevator door closed, they had made a list of how many artists that my work looked like, and then asked me, where are you from? And I said, I'm from St. Paul, Minnesota. And they said, darling, nothing ever happens in the middle of the country. And then they walked out. <laughs> and, but the next one that came in, it was a young dealer, just opened a space in Chelsea, loved the work and offered me a show in F February of that upcoming year and would not have happened any other way if hadn't met Art in General or Holly. But Holly did also bring up your name, Eleanor, and said, here's a list of some writers and you know, talked about your work with, I think it was the New, New Art Examiner and, yeah. right? and uh, Art, in, uh, Art in America. And I thought, I mean, as a young artist, thinking that a writer who was established as you was going to be coming into my space and, and writing about my work was just, um, just incredible. So Eleanor, thank you for, for collaborating with me on this project. Well, it was, you know, it, yeah, it was such a wonderful project. And I, I want to say also, um, you know, as, as Chris has pointed out, art in general was very important for the careers of a lot of artists and to help, you know, kind of move them forward to get them exposure, you know, to help them um, stimulate their ideas. But from a pr critic's perspective, I want to say that it was also very important to me as a critic. Um, I got to New York City from Minnesota in 1983. And so art in general had was was quite new at that time and I don't remember exactly when I stumbled upon it but you know I, very early on in my time in New York and of course that was a very exciting time you know East Village was opening up I mean it was it, there were so many things going on so many energies um, and I feel like art in general was an important part of my education as a critic because I you know I, I, critics also need to have their horizons expanded and and be exposed to things and that was one of the things that art in general I think was, was for me was very important. And the other thing I, I wanna say that, I mean, we've been hearing a lot about how important and, and serious um, um, you know, and profound the issues are that art, um, art in general was involved in. But I also wanna say that one of the things that was kind of wonderful too was that there was this sense of fun. Um, and you know, it was, it, sometimes I feel like a lot of that has disappeared from the art world. We've gotten so serious or so professional or something. But I'm just, I, I, when I was thinking about art in general, and I, one of the things I, I remember was a, um, a kind of very wacky um, event that my husband and I put on at art in general, and Holly was totally up for this. We, we had a, a Seder, a Passover Seder for 50 people. Um, do you remember that one, Martin? Uh, and and it, was, um, it, was, it was wild because, of course, there was no kitchen at art in general. So we had to bring everything in. And I remember that we brought in like all of these containers of matzo ball soup. And then we had, you know, all of these um, kind of 
hot plates that were, were, were plugged into the various, um, you know, electrical outlets throughout the floor, you know, with, with matzo bell, bell soup, you know, kind of uh, cooking away. And anyway, it was, it was kind of a wild thing, um, very funky, but it was, it was sort of thing that art in general would do. I, I don't know how many places today would do something like that. Um, so it was, it was not just, you know, it, I mean, it was very important and, and, you know, dealing with very profound and important issues, but it was fun. And I think it's important to remember that. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you, Chris. And I think it's also, um, uh, like Paul, uh, Chris, Chris is an artist who went on to found uh, his own artist space, uh, Second Shift Studio in St. Paul. And I hope we can, um, at the, uh, towards the end, come back and talk a little bit about uh, that space and, and the influence of art in general on, on your decision to do that. Sure. Um, our next guest uh, is Dean Dierko, who organized uh, two exhibitions and four public programs as a guest curator from 2000 to 2007. Their involvement in art, uh, with art in general br uh, bridges uh, Holly's tenure uh, to the start of Anne's tenure. Um, Dean, would you tell us about your experience as a curator and a member of the exhibition advisory committee? Absolutely. Um, Irene and, you know, to the whole crew at, at Brooklyn Rail, thanks so much for, for having me today. Um, Irene, as you mentioned, um, I guess my first exhibition that I put together um, at Art in General was in 2000. Um, the same year that I started a, an experimental space in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, called Parlor Projects. And you know, Teresa, very much like you said, um, Holly was one of these folks who was so open and so voracious about her appetites for younger artists and younger practices um, that very much um, the invitation that came um, was to me and to another exhibition space that operated out of Greenpoint called Bellwether Gallery. Um, Bellwether was founded, I believe, in 1999, if I'm correct, um, by Simone DeLora, Daphne Fitzpatrick, Matt Keegan, and Becky Smith. Um, we collaborated together on an exhibition that was called To Be Continued, um, that happened both at Art in General and at both of our spaces, um, mine in Williamsburg, theirs in Greenpoint. Um, I think there's something on the website that says that we were live linked with video. Um, I don't remember whether or not that happened, um, but I do remember quite a bit of excitement around the exhibition that we were able to put together. I remember inviting um, Rich Aldrich. Um, it was his first exhibition ever in New York. Um, Andrea Geyer in 1O and a number of other artists. Um, and as a young curator, I thought that it was an incredible opportunity to be presented with the, the chance to do the first really institutional exhibition that, that I had done um, while living in New York. Um, a bit later, what you're seeing in the image here um, is in 2002, I served on an exhibition advisory committee. Um, and we met to look at um, the artists who were submitting proposals for exhibitions. Um, and then I got very excited about this exhibition um, called The Mating Habits of Lines, Sketchbooks and Notebooks of Remorton, 1936 to 1977. Um, the exhibition was one that was curated by Janie Cohen and Barbara Zucker. And I was incredibly excited about, about the work. And, you know, we, we were able to bring the exhibition to art in general. Um, that happened in 2002. I remember at the same time, um, you know, being able to go to Ted Bonin at Alexander and Bonin, um, who I had met, and we were able to also bring some, some additional um, drawings and some sculptures in to add them to the exhibition um, to kind of widen the scope of what was being presented. Um, and it was a really incredible opportunity to be able to do that. Um, and then in 
I will say um, something that I wasn't necessarily part of, but I would say was part of a community of folks, is that in 2004, Art in General hosted um, what was called the LTTR Explosion. Um, LTTR is a genderqueer artist collective with a flexible project-oriented practice um, that was founded in 2001 by Ginger Brooks Takahashi, who I think is, is online with us today, um, Kate Hardy and Emily Royston, and they were later joined by Ulrika Muller and Lanka Tattersall. Um, and I should also say that um, Emily Royston is now known to us as Every Ocean Hughes. Um, although I was not directly a part of putting together this exhibition, it was certainly something that really affected my community, um, a community of kind of young queers um, who were active in, in New York, Los Angeles, and elsewhere through our connections to each other. Um, what you're seeing in this image are the results of some kind of collective layering of a number of pieces. The two squares that you see on the back, on the back of that wall, were a collaborative project by the artists Matt Keegan and Zyler Jane. And then the Makeout Couch um, was a project that was, um, that was done by Lighty Churchman and Louis Jacob. Um, so, and that was a very actively used makeout couch um, that happened throughout the, the performances and events that were scheduled by, by LTTR and the extended community throughout the, the four week run of that exhibition. It was a really kind of incredible energetic time. I remember, you know, moments where we shut down Walker Street doing performances that happened in the streets, artists like, MPA, Edie Fake, um, lots of folks, you know, very excited by, by that. And then um, lectures that happened that included folks like Greg Bordowitz, um, Eileen Miles, and a number, of, a number of other participants. It was a really incredible time. Um, and then I guess the, the last performances that I, that I helped to organize were in celebration of Art in General's 25th anniversary. Um, I organized a series that was called Where To? Um, there were a number of performances um, that happened. The first of them, an installation by Edie Fake and Duane Slightweight, um, who now many of you may know as the, the artist and sculptor Lee Relvis, um, who's based in New York. Um, then a second performance by Rachel Mason, and another performance by Elaine Tinyo. Um, and Elaine, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, but I think Elaine was involved also early on with Godzilla. Um, so that also feels like a bit of a, a, nice, a nice circle to close. Um, Elaine's performance or event um, invited folks to get together at Art in General for a dinner and we had um, menus from lots of the surrounding restaurants. And so everybody was ordering for delivery to Art in General. Um, it created an absolute chaos um, in the elevator and with all of the people that were delivering food those days. But I remember also having a really, really fun time um, during all of these events. And I think overall Art in General seemed to be one of those places that for me kind of welcomed me and gave me a real opportunity to kind of begin to think about community in an expanded way um, and to, to kind of participate and promote the, the kinds of ideas that all of these communities, um, intersecting communities that I was involved in were, were actively, actively doing. Thank you so much, Dean. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> We've now arrived at our last two panelists. As mentioned earlier in the program, Aliza Schwartz is, is the last artist to have an exhibition in the physical realm. Her solo exhibition purported opened in mid-February this year and was closed in mid-March due to COVID. Although the exhibition was truncated, um, it still was able to garner press and attention, and that speaks to how powerful the work is.
Um, Elisa, would you share with us um, the exhibition thesis and description of purported, as well as your experience, um, I guess, being flexible through COVID? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, so I just want to echo uh, everybody's thanks uh, to the Brooklyn Rail um, for hosting this and to Irene and Charlotte and Nick um, for putting everything together. Um, I believe Purported was actually open for two and a half weeks. Opening night was February 20th and the last open day was um, March 9th. And it's uh, my first solo exhibition in New York. Um, and it is certainly a kind of strange thing to be navigating that at you know, fairly early stage in my career. Um, and also just in relationship to, to this question, you know, I think that is sort of circling in many of our minds about what, what direction the art world's taking, especially um, because things are shifting so much and, and spaces like art in general are, are closing. Um, I just want to say maybe one thing uh, before I talk about the exhibition itself is it's just been such a pleasure hearing everybody's stories with the institution. Um, I didn't know Holly Block, but I really feel working with Laurel Patak on this exhibition echoed so many of the, the relationships um, everyone was talking about, the way in which a, a curator can really catalyze your ideas as a young artist and challenge you to take risks that you might not take. Um, and I was lucky to be able to work with Laurel um, in two contexts. Uh, this exhibition was first actually shown in Prague. That was my first international solo exhibition at um, Futura, um, which uh, was organized by Art in General. Um, and then Laurel and I brought it back to New York, um, which is where it was open for two weeks. And having both of those significant moments sort of bound up with art in general and also to have them be so discursive, to have them feel so collaborative um, with this very storied institution was, was really meaningful. Um, and I think pushed the work in ways that I, I can't imagine it growing otherwise. Um, so I'll talk a bit about the exhibition, which uh, I think makes sense just because so much of my work is really bound up with questions of intergenerational activism. Um, the piece you're seeing right now in the image is a work called Sight Sight. It was a um, new commission for uh, the space of art in general. It's installed there in the windows. It's actually still there, even though the, the space is now empty. So uh, if you're in Dumbo and you walk by, you'll still see um, these panes in the window. Um, but I understand this as a, a kind of poem of feminine interdiction. So it represents snippets of different contexts um, reaching back over 100 years um, of times people, mainly women, tried to speak for themselves or to speak, uh, to speak on behalf of others and were not believed. Um, it's a huge citational matrix. There's actually citations to the Guerrilla Girls in it um, that really is invested in this question of how things like agency or consent can arise outside the framework of the individual. And this is part of a kind of historical and collective practice. Um, if we go to the next slide, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the work. Um, oh, all right, yeah, great. Um, so this is the interior. Um, and I, I was just thinking a lot about the issues that the different panelists brought up um, as things that you know I've, I've also been thinking about as a, as a fairly early career artist. Um, this question of discursive space and the internet and what happens when you know, everything goes on social media, which, which Paul brought up is something I've thought a lot about. The, the long scrolls that you see hanging on the left side of the image are continuous screen grabs of moments where things have gone viral on the internet. Um, and the length of those scrolls is really mainly constituted by uh, angry people, mainly trolls leaving angry comments um, in response to, to, again, different moments where people tried to do something, say something, express something, um, and found themselves doubted. Um, and then what you see on um, the right side of the image is a piece called Anthem, which I'm actually fortunate enough to be, um, uh, to have a, a present, to be presenting a, a kind of continuation of uh, currently at the eighth floor um, I have a new commission, which is based on the research that was began in Anthem. But what you see there, um, there's a partial image of, is um, all of the different uh, sexual assault evidence collection kits or rape kits that are used in the US. Um, they're all widely different. They all package the body and package this question of consent in different ways. And again, raise that issue, which is something I've been thinking a lot about. Um, both in relationship to contemporary politics and also my own work and also the history and legacy of queer and feminist art, which is whose voice counts, whose voice is heard, whose voice is legible, and who gets to be believed. 
Um, so in many ways, you know, even though the exhibition was short, um, I, I do feel like art in general has framed these these questions for me in a way that is really bound up with its legacy. Um, so many of the things that have come up during the talk are, are touchstones for me in my own career. I remember being in college and uh, learning about LTTR and having my, my mind blown that an art practice could look like that. Um, so it's really meaningful to be a part of this kind of historical continuing network of artists um, and art workers who are engaged in this kind of practice. Um, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm really grateful for the fact that, you know, even though the exhibition was short, um, it did get quite a lot of coverage. Uh, Brooklyn Rail, um, there's a fantastic review by Elizabeth Bewey. It's totally brilliant. Um, takes me, you know, to sort of up on my, my modernist relationship to the grid. Um, and there were uh, interviews I did for Art in America, EFLUX, um, and an extended interview that will be coming out in October, um, I think in their, uh, their winter issue. Um, and that really speaks um, to, you know, not only, I think, the work, perhaps its, its relevance and relationship to contemporary issues and politics, but also to the lasting legacy of art in general. Art in general was a platform that made this possible for me. Art in general is a historical nexus. It's a community of people. It's an active relationship in many ways that I think um, that I'm really privileged to be a part of. Or I feel really privileged to be a part of because for me, it's not only been a platform for my work, but also a way of framing my investment in the art world. I feel aligned very much with the people who've come through art in general, with the different purposes that have been articulated um, in that space as a platform. Um, so for me, even though art in general as a physical space is no longer as an institution might not be any longer, there's a kind of ethic which I hope to carry forward in, in my future works. Um, and maybe just to close, I'll say that um, I'm also fortunate enough to have a show two doors down for art in general currently, um, the kind of uh, sister space in many ways, um, AIR, which is another artist run, artist founded space. Um, it's actually really amazing to learn that Holly Block, uh, her gorilla girl's name was Ana Mendieta. Ana Mendieta was one of the founding um, members of AIR. Um, so there's a way in which, you know, I, I already feel this kind of continuing work taking shape. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really lovely to be celebrating that legacy with all of you today. and and to be toasting, as I know we will, the kind of way in which that's going to move forward. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, that's, uh, thank you. Our last speaker uh, is Jacob Proctor, the Gilbert and Ann Kinney Art New York collector of the Archives of American Art. Jacob was one of the first persons I contacted when I started because it was always my intention to secure Art in General's legacy in advance of its 40th anniversary. He is also the one who pointed me to Art Resources Transfer. Um, a fun fact is Jake's, Jacob's spouse is Lisa Oppenheim, the artist who was a, um, a new, commission, uh, new commissions artist in 2013. Um, Jacob, I would love for you to speak about the importance of this gift and the legacy of art in general. It, <clears throat> thanks, Irene, um, and thanks to the rail um, for uh, for putting this together. Um, it was interesting when Irene uh, first contacted me. Um, I had actually just very recently taken up my position with the Smithsonian and the archives, um, and I was actually still uh, still living in Germany at the time. Um, and my relationship, I was incredibly enthusiastic and just really excited by this because I had always been, you know, a fan and an admirer of art in general, um, having seen lots of shows there over the years, first as a student and then as a, as a professional, I guess, um, having had friends who worked there for many years as curators um, and just generally a, like a real admirer um, of the institution. Um, I think I tried twice to sort of borrow the idea of the art in the elevator um, for other institutions where I was working. Um, and you know, of course, also my, uh, my wife also uh, organized an exhibition um, as part of the new commissions um, series uh, several years ago. Um, and so it was, of course, I was enthusiastic about this prospect of having the art in general records become one of my first acquisitions um, for the archives. Uh, but 
as sort of COVID um, <laughs> sort of dragged on, um, and I was stuck in Germany, and we kind of somehow very quickly transformed from what I had initially anticipated being a kind of methodical process um, leading up to this celebration of the 40th anniversary, um, sort of quickly became more of like a rescue mission um, in terms of having to work kind of against time and against the uh, sort of all of the, the constraints um, that COVID and New York being quite shut down uh, posed in terms of accessing these records, um, assessing them, and, uh, and ultimately um, acquiring them and preserving them. Um, and the, the box that, the, the slide that I'm showing is the first, that's the first box um, of materials that I reboxed uh, they took out of, they were all in, you know, non-archival uh, boxes. And that's the first box that I finished going through and pulling out duplicate material and material that's kind of out of scope um, or with limited research value. Um, and I remember I took a picture of it um, as, and sent it to my, my colleagues in DC because I'm also working on this more or less, uh, you know, our offices are still mostly shut and we're mostly still working remotely. Um, but this project, uh, the urgency and kind of the need uh, to, um, to make sure that this, this material wasn't lost uh, meant that I, I started coming in actually to the office um, really to, to just to work um, on this. Um, I should probably say a little bit about the Archives of American Art, which is not um, something that everyone is familiar with. Uh, the archives were founded in 1954, uh, actually at the Detroit Institute of Arts, um, and joined the Smithsonian in 1970. And um, the archives collects, preserves, and most importantly, makes available uh, primary source materials uh, documenting the history of art, um, or history of the visual arts in the United States. Um, and so all the art historians in the audience, I'm sure, are aware of this, but uh, you know, our resources um, really serve as references for countless dissertations, exhibitions, books, catalogs, articles, uh, you name it, um, on, uh, on the, visual, the history of the visual arts uh, in, in the United States. Um, we have more than 20 million um, objects in our collection, um, ranging from letters, diaries, manuscripts, financial records, uh, lots of different kinds of photographic and uh, photographic and audiovisual materials, um, as well as the largest collection of oral histories um, on the subject of art, uh, really anywhere in the world. Um, and so, coming into the Smithsonian uh, and into the Archives of American Art, the Art in General um, organizational records will already they'll join um, some very kindred records, kindred collections um, that are already uh, in our holdings, um, like for example, uh, thread waxing space or the first couple of decades of printed matter, um, artist talks on art, and countless uh, different um, art, other artist-run galleries and spaces um, around the country. Um, so, you know, as these, uh, right now, um, this is the first box. There are more than 100 more to go through. So this is a very large collection for, you know, it's 40 years of, um, of, of activity in a lot of different arenas, um, not just at exhibitions, but also residency programs, edu like innovative education programs, um, publications, screenings, um, performances. Uh, so now that we are accessioning it, um, it'll be professional, our professional archivists um, and curators like myself will um, go through and organize and preserve the materials, create a finding aid, um, and ultimately it will be available to anyone who is interested. Um, you know, assuming that we can start doing things in person again one day, um, you know, really uh, member, any member of the public um, can access our materials um, in our reading room uh, in Washington, D.C., or in our research center here in New York. Um, they can have things digitized on demand, or they can visit us online to consult materials that have already been digitized. 
So I really feel like um, it's, uh, you know, this is an institution that meant a lot to me over the years. And I think it's, I'm, I'm extremely proud that we were able to, uh, um, to, to do this so quickly um, under these circumstances to bring it into the collection. Yes, yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacob. And thank you all. Um, thank you uh, to all the speakers. Um, before I return the podium back to Charlotte, and I also see that Fong's joined us, I'd like to conclude my section with a few thoughts that I'd like to share um, with, uh, with everyone. Um, COVID, is off COVID has often been described as an act of God, which in legal parlance and insurance policy is a natural event or disaster where no one is at fault or liable. And in continuing with this semi-religious metaphor, 40 years is also a symbolic period of time that in all three Abrahamic faith traditions, um, in all three Abrahamic faith traditions, 40 years is the period of time that it takes an, for a new generation to arise. And so, and so to close art in general upon reaching its 40th anniversary, is our way of welcoming and making space for new arts organizations such as the ones that we've heard about today. These new organizations will continue to do the integral work of supporting artists and their work. Um, the board and I are very excited about the future and the generations and the next generation of artists to come. So um, Charlotte will now facilitate the conversation between the speakers then we'll open it up to discussion to the entire audience. Thank you so much. It really, it's just been so great, everyone, hearing you all, you know, share your stories, talk about the kinds of collaborations that happened on many different levels. Um, you may not be aware, but, you know, even in the chat, uh, some of our audience members have been sharing extraordinary stories. So if you haven't taken a look at the chat, I can recommend, please scroll through. People were throwing in stories, telling their own backgrounds and relationships they had either with you as speakers or with other experiences at Art in General. And so I actually, I mean, what I thought would be a nice way to just get us going is to talk about that as being one of the key recurring things that comes up around art in general, even as regards its archive, right? That it's, it's, a, it's in the midst of being, to be shared, right? That people will be able to go there in this free reading room and be able to research it. I mean, it's just an extraordinary sort of generosity of spirit. And so that, however, is a really difficult thing to do right now. <laughs> um, there's, there's health reasons why we don't want to be generous with our spirits, so to speak. But there's also just, you know, as some of you have spoken about, you know, there's a, there's a sense in the world today, uh, a politics in the world today that can keep people very separate, um, that can make it more difficult to feel like you want to share or put things out there. So one of the things I wanted to ask is given your time at Art in General in whatever capacity, how have you tried to maintain some of that spirit that you might have glimpsed and partook in while you were at Art in General into the other things you do? Like what's that moment you remember of something that happened where you go, I, I've got to keep doing that. Wherever I go, whatever I do, don't forget that and make that happen for others. It's open to all of you. I guess I would say that the, uh, the recognition that Holly was one of those, those kind of directors, curators who was so artist centric um, is something that has always been really at the, at the heart of my own curatorial practice. Um, the idea that all you really need to do, it's not, it's not brain surgery is listening to artists and what they're doing, what the work they're making, what they're talking about, the folks that they wanna introduce you to, all of those things. Um, and those become really ways to make for very dynamic conversations once they, they find a, a physical form. Um, I think it was really incredible that art in general, for me, was one of those places that also really function as an example of how that could happen. 
Um, and over the years, it was a, a great place to look at exhibitions, especially for, for kinds of conceptual and critical practices. Um, those were the kinds of exhibitions that I always remember seeing at Art in General and, and really having a, a great time looking at and thinking about. I'd like to echo what Dean said about Holly. I mean, she was such a fierce advocate for me personally, while I was an artist at Art in General, calling up um, gallerists and writers and just anybody to come in to see the work. And I never forgot that. And um, just this last, um, last year, my wife and I started a residency program in um, St. Paul, in the community in which we live and work. And it's a, it's a, a one-year residency program for women and non-gender conforming artists based in the Twin Cities. So they get a free studio space, a stipend. And we also, we bring in museum directors and curators to come visit their work and um, just to give them as much exposure and connection within their community as possible. So definitely I, I got lessons from art in general of how to do that right and how to treat artists. I might um, add a little bit as well. Uh, just, um, I think one thing that art in general or my experience working with art in general um, and specifically my experience working with Laurel, which I think you know echoes so many of the things you guys are saying about working with Holly is that as an artist, you know, we're always, I think, you know, so grateful for any exhibition opportunity we have, we get told, you know, about you know, how exposure is so good for us. And, you know, often there's a sort of trap that happens where you get paid in exposure. And of course, you know, we can all die of exposure. Um, but one thing that art in general has really empowered me to think about is the way that I as an artist have agency and that I can insist on that agency and I can find people who will enable me, empower me and recognize me and that that exists. That, that kind of structural disempowerment in the art world that we see in so many places is not the way it has to be. And places like art in general and in you know, other, other places that work within that spirit um, are making a different kind of space for a different kind of artwork, a different kind of engagement and a different kind of community. Um, so that's, that's one thing that I know I'll take forward from, from this experience. I think, uh... What I've taken from many years ago from Art in General was this sense of collaboration. The artists were collaborating, um, exhibitions were collaborating. It was not, it, that had been lost for a long time. It became a commercial uh, venue more than anything else. So I always wanted to keep that uh, alive or that idea that especially now we should be exchanging ideas and create, sometimes my students, the younger generation, they ask, what, what do you do? Just connect with each other and create your own shows. If you don't like what you're seeing and you want to see a show, put it on, do, do, take it on to, you know, take the responsibility to really do it. So that, in general, in the time back there was a lot about artists and curators and writers collaborating in a way that I hope revives and continues. Martin, I, we, yeah. So. Are we, okay. Now we can hear you, yes. <laughs> One thing that was also important to uh, Art in General and Holly specifically, was that it wasn't enough just to make the work um, an artist had to survive in the world. And many artists uh, started their careers in their vacuum of a studio and didn't consider, because it wasn't necessary, what happened later in terms of um, taxes and all kinds of crap. And she uh, was, she put together workshops that were meant to assist artists throughout their career, how basically it was a survival guide, um, how to keep track of all kinds of things that were necessary to maintain your career in the outside world. And um, that was something that I was really amazed by. 
I think for me, the other thing as a lesson going forward for larger organizations, particularly seeing what's going on in art institutions around the country, is that Holly instituted a series of town halls every couple of years. Yeah. We'd invite artists from the communities and say, are we still doing what you need? Mm. Mm. And the residencies came out of that. Mm. Mm. It was direct feedback. What do you need? We and she were constantly aware of the fact that although the, inst the organization started in 81, the needs of artists in 91 <laughs> were very different and you couldn't get stale. You had to keep in touch with what was necessary if you were meant to serve a community. And that was the whole point. It wasn't just to make people famous and get a show for somebody. It was to serve a group, a whole world of people. I think one of the things that is really interesting about how the way everyone's framing this is the sense of um, simpatico, right? The, the sense of just sort of connecting, right? And finding means of connection. And yet, as I think Eleanor mentioned uh, when she was speaking, that can become um, overbearing, right? There's nothing as like too much sympathy from someone to make you want to want to withdraw, that, that, that there's an element of fun, that there's an element of um, whimsy, of, of, of challenge, you know, is, is, is so important to being able to do some of the types of political work that you all have been talking about and that were a part of what Art in General was trying to foster. So I'm just wondering if any of you can speak a, a little bit as to how, I mean, where, where, how do you cut yourself off? How do you, how do you keep it from going down that, you know, long road where you become pedantic and professorial and you're making sure that everyone really understands what you mean so that people can still actually just enjoy it and, and have some sense of fun, even as they're engaging topics that are, um, that are groundbreaking, which Art in General is so known for. Well, I, I mean, I think one of the kind of great models, in fact, is the Gorilla Girls, you know, and um, so that's something I think to, I to keep in mind. I mean, there was a group that was dealing with this very, you know, very serious issue and yet in such a, a, a kind of theatrical and playful way that, that it brought people in, you know, and, and it, was, um, it, was, it was just such an engaging way to deal with things. So I think it's important to keep models like that in mind that, you know, you, you have to think about who you're addressing and, and, um, and how do you reach them and humor, I think, and, and wit um, and playfulness are very important elements in that. I guess I would also say that it's, it's an element of risk taking of, you know, that moment where you get to try something new that hasn't been tried before. Um, you know, I remember when we were putting together To Be Continued, um, one of the artists that I was working with, um, In Wan O, oh, had created a piece that was made out of um, powdered incense. And so it was a huge block um, with all the names of gay bars that had closed in New York. And so we lit one side of it, and over the course of three days, um, the piece burned up and turned eventually into ash that was all swept into the center and pushed aside. Um, that moment, just that simple moment of being able to create a piece in an exhibition space that put off this incredible smell for three days, was something that I think a lot of spaces right now would not do anymore. It's a really kind of simple um, activity, a simple act, um, but it's that kind of risk taking and that kind of thinking outside the box that I think art in general um, really supported. Um, you know, eventually this, this um, edition three of LTTR, the magazine was called Practice More Failure. 
And I think that 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 sense of things, of this kind of push to try something new, try something that that may actually fail, and if it does, just try and fail spectacularly. So, because, I mean, you all have been telling such stories, and again, I just want to direct everyone to also check out some of the great stories that are in the chat. It's been really lovely to read uh, the responses. So if you haven't, um, definitely take a look. But I definitely want to give us a chance to have the audience um, speak to some of their questions. So at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Nick, um, and we'll take some questions from the audience. And then, um, you know, get your glasses ready because we want to keep celebrating. Thank you, Charlotte, and thank you, Irene, and everyone involved. This has been a really beautiful celebration. Um, so yeah, we have time for a couple of questions. Um, I'm first going to hand the mic over to our very own publisher and artistic director, Fong Louie. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Irene. Thank you, Paul, Eleanor. Um, and the rest of you all, this is so inspiring because the other um, common ground last week, last Thursday, when we welcomed Valerie Bell and Wen Carr, Eric Gardner's mother, and to the tail end, you know, both of whom never really had to speak public, in public ever, and they told the struggle of how to write down things and memorize it, and then finally when they did try to speak for memorization, they didn't feel it was truthful. So then they found the courage to speak from their heart. And the two of the tail end, um, I think it was Wen who um, quoted that line from Dylan Thomas' famous poem, Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night. And I didn't get a chance to complete that several line that followed that say, why a man who caught and sang the sun in flight and learned too late, they grieve it on its way do not go gentle into that good night, which is a, a poem that every one of us remember how to essentially die with dignity. And that's a very important thing to, to remember here where we are now celebrating art in general. But I wanna say a few things to Holly, who was a friend. I didn't spend as much time as I wanted to because I was so busy, but Holly, like the rest of us, you mentioned she started out as an artist. And that's a very important thing to celebrate those who essentially came to understand that they don't have the, um, the, the stamina that, you know, seven days a week in the studio in solitude. You know, I think it's important, Charlotte, that you brought up that whole notion of simpatico. You know, and I think that's very important to go back to Immanuel Kant's idea of teleology, the a philosophical idea where natural phenomena are explained in terms of purpose they serve rather than the cause by which they arise. In other words, to find that natural end to our life is so important. Like I'm an artist and I realize that I don't have the similar dedication you know, seven days a week, that dedication. I just realized that I enjoy collaboration with other artists and other creative individual in the cultural world, you know, the community. And I think that's very important because if you're born to be a natural piano player, but in your head is telling you, you should play the percussion, you know? And that's, that's super unhappy. It's not a good way to go. So I just remember talking to uh, Holly that, yes, she did train and did work with Jack Reynolds. Do you remember? Jack Reynolds is one of the master fundraiser in the art world period. Uh, <laughs> and she worked with Jack uh, at Washington Project for the Art in DC. And Jack also started out as, a, as an artist, as Fluxus artist in University of Santa Cruz. And same thing with Jim Melcher, his boss at the NEA. So I just want to make sure that we should always celebrate those who have been artists and then do something else to help out the art community. 
Paula Cooper is one of them. Even Anne Ladobach started out uh, an artist who essentially became also a poet. So I can give and provide so many names and name those individuals, but essentially getting back to the continuity. I think it's so important you will express that eloquently. Eleanor and I worked a long time together. And I remember, we all remember when we first learned about theory of relativity. Remember how Richard Freeman, one of my favorite, who say that the ripple effects by, say, by providing an, a, a brief example of a gentle movement of butterflies' wings flying over the river's surface have a tremendous effect how the direction of the current water below is flown. And I think that's so important what Art in General has done. When I spoke to Irene the other night, uh, I essentially said, absolutely, the Brooklyn Railroad inspired by one publication in 1916 and 17, 10 issue is called the Seven Arts. No one heard about it ever. But that is so important to the rail um, section, how it's laid out in different, um, you know, uh, bring about the various discipline and community together. So now thinking finally, since Chris Lawson uh, was talking about the second shift studio in St. Paul, uh, dedicated to women artists, particularly those who are gender non-conforming. And I'm very proud to be on that board. Similar, Paul was talking about Denison Hill. Very similar idea um, that's dedicated to community of LGBTQ. And I'm about to join their board. There's only a few board people you know, that I think I can have the energy to join them. So the continuity is beautiful, that ripple effect. So Art in general have created that feminine uh, in our cultural live and I know that it having a tremendous effect every time I have spent time there and talked to Holly and now with you all. So I, I'm very hopeful and very optimistic because I'm constantly reminded by this beautiful Zambian proverb that say, if you want to go alone, go fast, go, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So the community is huge. Uh, it's so important to how the longevity of what we do. So for that, I thank you. I'm grateful to you. All, and uh, I wait till a few more questions and join you with a glass of wine. Back to you, Nikki. Thank you, Fong. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, in the interest of time, because I know a couple of people have to go to another meeting soon, um, I want to pass the mic off, uh, or not off, I'd like to pass the mic over to Ginger. Uh, to ask a question, and uh, Ginger, you should be able to speak now. Sure. Oh, I didn't realize it was, I was going to be asking a question. <laughs> We're making um, an observation or sharing a story. Yeah, sure. I just wanted to share a little background um, on um, LTTR and the explosion. Um, I was starting to type it into the chat, and I thought it would be fun um, to share it with everyone. So, um, I'm one of the co-founders and co-editors and back in, I guess it was 2004, um, we were working with Sofia Hernandez and she had invited us to do um, a piece, like an installation in the downstairs storefront space. And the budget for that kind of a project was around $300. And when we came back with our proposal of what we wanted to do, um, she realized that we needed more space and we pushed for that and they were able to rearrange things and they offered the galleries upstairs and um, were also able to expand the budget. And yeah, it was incredible. She knew that what we wanted to do was going to explode out of that space and all over into the streets as it did. So yeah, I'm so grateful to um, Art in General. Maybe, uh, maybe that's the perfect moment then, Charlotte, to raise a toast. 
All right, everyone. Well, I'm going to hand it over to Irene, but I'm going to be your, you know, in the middle of the day, celebratory. I thought, you know, there had to be some kind of popping that happened because it has been such an honor to be a part of this celebration of art in general. I think the key message I just want to say, and as I've been thinking about all this, is that it's really important that we always remember that the arts continue to do their work and that the organizations and the artists, we love them in the moment that they're doing what they do. And then that energy and that vitality gets picked up and it keeps on going by the people who've been a part of it, but also by new voices that we don't even know of yet who were inspired on the sidelines and have go on to do other things. So if I can just say for my little bit before I hand it over to Irene, I hope everyone who's here today continues to tell that story that we just keep going. There is no stopping. This isn't the end, there is no end. And sometimes that means you shake up a bottle of the champagne in the middle of the afternoon. So Irene, it's over to you. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, thank you all. Let's raise our glasses to Toast Art in General, an organization that has fostered thousands of artists and supported their creative visions, um, that has strengthened artistic ties across communities and nations, and now endows its archive to benefit uh, others to come. May art in general always be a space where we can build, grow, and create. Thank you, art in general, for your contribution to all of us. Um, may the spirit of art in general continue forward always. Cheers. Salute. Salute. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> Hooray. Thank you, everybody. Thank That's you for this. Thank you so much. Thank you, you guys. Thank Woo. you. So much. Hi, Eleanor. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you. Cheers to art in general and cheers to that. Yeah. Well, you're glad. Thank you, Vaughn. Thank you, Dean. <laughs> hey, Chris. Thank, Thank you, Vaughn. I'm so glad you joined us. Oh, yeah. Wouldn't miss it in the world. Thank you, Robin. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Terrific. And, uh, last but not least, though, oh. we, we still have a tradition at the rail. Um, oh, geez. Not done. Okay. And yes, of ending, of ending our conversations and our events with a poetry reading. And Today, we are very lucky to have with us Kate Meissner. I'll give a very quick bio and then hand the mic over to Kate. Uh, Kate Meissner is the author of the illustrated poetry book, Let It Die Hungry. Her latest projects include the comics poetry zine, Pep Talks for Broken Peoples, and the series, New York Strange. She is currently the Prison and Justice Writing Program Director at Penn America. Kate, I am handing the mic over to you. Thank you so much. What uh, incredible history. I learned so much. It makes me very nostalgic for uh, New York of yesteryear and of yester month and uh, just what an incredible legacy art in general has. Thank you everybody for sharing. I feel really inspired. Um, when I was invited to read a poem, I said, well, what's the context, of course, and wanted to know. And I said, oh, I think I have something for that. It's an Ill I'm going to read one of my illustrated comic vignettes from New York Strange. It, uh, it is uh, about artists. It's a little tongue in cheek. I hope it's a little fun like people were talking about. And so I'm going to share my screen and, uh, and cap us off uh, with great honor. All right, can you see it? Yes, okay, great. So it's volume five in the series, New York Strange, a special, not special, true story vignette series by me. And it starts with a quote by Robert, Robert Frank, excuse me. We're all being watched. It gets sillier and sillier, as if all action is meaningful. Nothing is really all that special. It's just life. So we start off in a cool little Brooklyn cafe. Oh, I miss Mona. Wonder if Frida will come in today. You might recognize these folks. What is art anyway? I'm gonna tell you the real guy's name. Seth asks. His sweatshirt says, I'm not depressed, I'm cynical. What is art anyway, Seth asks, when I run into him after many years, an old friend of a high school boyfriend who recently relocated to Brooklyn, lives in a van, showers at the gym, and now only paints as a form of joke. Seth says he pieces together found Basquiat collages at his day 
job, excavated from the apartment of an ex-girlfriend. It's just a shitty gig only other artists think is cool, he shrugs, not like dino bones. In the stretch between subways, a poet writes for donations. What is the line between making it and failing? Would it have counted as art when I was broken? I paid someone to help put me back together. Get a therapist and forget making it, Seth, I tell him, with my newfound sick-of-it-all authority, convincing myself under the funhouse mirror of shiny billboards and other people's dreams. There are other forms of currency. Like eyes. And yes, it does say star sucks coffee. Like last night, when I stopped to use the bathroom across from Lincoln Center, the sidewalks were nearly immaculate. A security guard looked around and reported to his radio, no homeless, all clear. Behind him in plain sight, a couple sat with hand painted signs begging for change. Thank you all for letting me share during your celebration. What a gift. Uh, thank you for all your work over the years. I'm blown away and very grateful. Thank you so much, Gates. Not uh, everyone is clapping. If we were in a physical room, it would be uh, uproarious. I loved Irene's laugh at the, um, at the, the farting, you know, farting painting. <laughs> May we never be above laughing at a fart joke. Uh, I, I, I want to thank, thank you, Kates, for that reading. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us today. Thank you, Dean, Eleanor, Chris, Paul, Jacob, Eliza, Robin, Teresa, and Martin, and of course, Irene and Charlotte for leading us today. Um, I, I want to say that we also do this every day at 1 p.m. Uh, please join us tomorrow for a conversation between artist Jacoby Satterwhite and Rail Art Scene Editor Sarah Rafino will conclude with a poetry reading from Jen Fisher. Um, but, but it's an honor to host this. Everyone thanked the rail today for hosting this, but it's an honor to host this uh, for an organization like Art in General, uh, that this lineage and this energy we're talking about is, is really crucial to what we do. And as the rail is celebrating its 20th anniversary this month, um, you know, that's more important now than ever. So. Um, have a wonderful day, everyone. I believe you all can now unmute yourselves uh, or activate your mics and say hello or share a story before we go. I think, I think it should Thank work. You, it should work. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Irene. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Chris. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you all. Eleanor, thank you. Thank you, Eliza. Stay safe. Stay safe. You too, okay? Thank you, Charlotte. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Much love and Bye. Thanks, everyone. Hey, Bye. super good. I call you later, <laughs> too, Eleanor. Okay, good. I will. Thank you. Bye, Charlotte. Thank Bye, you all. Bye, bye, Andrew. Let's get some some lunch, <laughs> late lunch. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Party. Bye. Woo. Bye. 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 Party. Much love and courage, you guys. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.